Hey, Jack, how are you doing? Hi, Jamie. <laughs> I am good. It's lovely to see you. And thank you so much for having me on the podcast. No worries. So whereabouts are you in the world? Because obviously we've had COVID. Everyone's everywhere. So where are you? I am at home um, in Essex uh, in my little home built studio uh, with my uh, mic and uh, and you in front of me. And that's, that's about it, really. I mean, it doesn't <laughs> really get better than that, does it? I was I was just saying before before we came on to uh, start recording how like set up you are, like you've got everything there, like the whole kind of shebang. It's amazing. Yeah. But obviously you you do radio, so it would make sense for you to have all the equipment. Well, yeah, it's that, but also as well, I'm I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to those kind of things. Uh, I love geeking out on tech. Um, like the PC I've got is completely built by myself. I bought all the parts, put it together like it was adult Lego. You, and, well, you, uh, you built your own computer? Yeah, it's got lights on it and everything. Do you want me to show you? I can just turn I, the camera I, yeah, around please, so you please, can see. I'd love to see but, it. I'd love to see it. So, look, oh wow! Yeah, it's not got a baby Yoda inside of it. It's just reflected off the glass. The baby oh, right. Yoda's down. I, I thought, I thought that was like that, down the bottom, next right. level. Next level. It does <laughs> look like Yoda. it's inside it though, doesn't it? But yeah, I, I, so I built the whole thing for myself, and that was my that was a little project for myself during lockdown. And um, yeah, it's been it's been good. It's, I've used it for everything from the live streams to broadcasting and interviews and recording my mtv show on i've used it for everything so yeah it's been yeah. very valuable how how has it been live streaming from essex well uh i could do with a better internet connection that's for sure i needed far better upload speed to to do it properly but mm -hmm. it's been it's been very rewarding actually to be honest with you i feel more connected and closer to my audience than i have ever been um Amazing. and i actually would say that Although a global pandemic is far from ideal for many, many people, I think on a selfish personal standpoint, you always have to try and look at the positives. Yeah. Um, and I don't think I would be this close to my audience and have such a great understanding of them as I do now if the pandemic didn't happen. Is that because you've sort of slowed down? What, what, why you, why you've yeah. come closer? Is that, is that what it is? I think so, Jamie. Yeah, I, th I think it's because everyone has slowed down to a level playing field mm. to the point where everyone's on exactly the same wavelength. We're all in the same position doing it together, no matter if you're right at the top of, you know, like the game or, you know, you're all the way, all the way down at the bottom doing whatever. It's everyone's a level playing field. And um, and so for the first time, really, actually, in probably most people's lifetimes, you can kind of count everyone as a, as a fellow peer, which I think is quite a special thing to do. And mm. um, I very quickly discovered that when the first lockdown came in. I'm the kind of person that is very driven to, uh, to uh, adapt and take advantage of new situations and think of creatively around them and, and adapt with new ideas. Um, and so the, the live streaming was, was one of those. Um, and then there was a, I've got a server, there's a Discord server. I don't know if you know about Discord at all, but it's basically an app, um, which is you can host your own server on there and um, and fans can come and be a part of this server and you can create different chats and there are, you can have video calls with them, voice chats with them. And it's just a totally interactive thing where your whole fan base can hang out and um, wow. create one of those and it's popping. And we just literally, that well, they uh, celebrated a year of the discord server as of the 11th of april 2020 when it started so we've just had a year when we're recording this and they made a half an hour youtube video um of all the best bits of content from the live streams the radio shows the tv shows um everything with personalized messages edited into a half an hour long video and they were like we've got a surprise you need to live stream now." so i live streamed and they sent me the link and i played it on stream to about 100 of them who were hanging out with me and um and I was in floods of tears in hysterical laughter for about half an hour just flipping Aww. between the two it was just the most incredible thing and it really made me realize um how important what I'd done or what I'd created was to them they've made friends from the other side of the world which they never would have known existed mm -hmm. before all of this happened before I created this server and that kind of thing so um 
yeah, it's this this whole period of time has been quite a special one for me in a weird kind of way, actually. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? How we don't look back at what we've done. We always, I, I mean, I can understand that you're very ambitious. I'm very ambitious as well. Like I like, I like to keep moving forward every single day. I want to be productive mm. and, and keep growing. But it's quite nice in this moment of uncertainty. A lot of people have been reflecting on their different paths, but also what they've achieved and what sort of future they, they want as well. And so I think it's nice for you as well to have that moment to really see how your content or how you in your space has affected people. Affected people. It, it's just, it's yeah. such an important thing. You're so, so right. We should always be reflective on our own achievements and give ourselves a pat on the back and celebrate them. I don't do it enough for sure. No, and I, th I don't think for successful and yeah. driven people do. I just think because we're no. always moving forward. That's why you're totally right. And it, and it, it certainly feels like it feels like some, it feels like a, uh, almost a crime to rest on your laurels. Yeah. So you know of, what yeah. I mean? I feel, I feel, and this probably isn't a good thing, but I feel guilty if I'm not necessarily being productive mm. or thinking ahead or what's yeah. next. Yeah. I've got a lot better at it because yeah. I th again because of the lockdown i think but i remember there was a there was a real time where i wouldn't stop for seven days a week i would be constantly doing something my girlfriend would be like let's go out and do something i was like no 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 I'm just, i've got i've got to do this i've got to do this I'm just const constantly be driven yeah. and um that could be quite it could be damaging it can it did it happened to me when i was in my early 20s when i just just graduated and i was doing like seven days a week for two years and then i burnt mm. out like really badly burnt oh, out yeah. and I learned, I learned very, very early on what balance was. And it's the same thing now. Like as much as I, you have to be productive and you want to be improving yourself. And there's so much curiosity about people who are ambitious uh, in this sort of world. It's about knowing when enough is enough. And I think that's the balance going, okay, I've done enough today from six to I've worked from like 7 a.m. to whatever, 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. I don't need to do any more now. Like, and there's some people who, when you get to that point where you just, you're working to like 2 a.m. in the morning, but then that, that window of productivity goes down the window because obviously you can only be produ productive for so long. And mm. I think you have to learn that balance of like, when is it, when's enough? When, when do you feel like you've done enough for today? It's, it's feeling, um, it, I think now that I understand that and I know the feeling of being content, mm. Once you feel that feeling of being content and having that balance, like you say, I don't think there's ever, there's no going back to the way you were before because you understand how much work you need to do, the effort you need to put in and when you need to do that balanced out with giving yourself enough time to relax. Like, I mean, I've played a lot of video games during this lockdown, a lot of video games, but it has been a saving grace for me in that sense. Like one escape, but also I get to, I was essentially hanging out with my mates, you know? Yeah. And what, what, where, what's, your, what's your favorite video game? Well, uh, I played quite a few. So I played quite a few horrors right at the start. I am terrible at <laughs> horror, by the way. So why? Well, it was more for the entertainment of the stream. But yeah, I played um, Until Dawn. And um, although The Last of Us is not so much a horror, there is zombie elements to it. And there are a few jump scares and stuff. But it's more about the story mode and... And that's a stunning story. I've never played a video game with such an amazing storyline to it. It was like a movie. It was incredible. Um, and uh, but the until until dawn game was essentially like a load of college students go to investigate the death of their friend from years ago, and they kind of go back on the anniversary and find out it's all like a horror scene, all this kind of. Oh thing. wow! I mean, um, I haven't played a video game for a long time, and I feel like they, yeah. they've adapted and they've got so much better these narratives. Oh, it's now. incredible! Yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, and then there, there's a character in that, and it, and you kind of um, you have you get to make choices. It's like the butterfly effect, right? So you yeah. you get to make choices within the game, and those certain choices affect how the story pans out. So you can have multiple different endings. Um, and there was this one character that the stream were particularly connected to and that I really liked as well called Mike. He was like the, uh, he was like the jock, right? He's like the strong male character here to save the day kind of thing. And he did that throughout the whole story that I managed to play until the very end when my finger slipped on the button and I got him killed right at the end. Oh no. And then, and, <laughs> and the stream went nuts at me. They were like, we're never coming back ever again. We can't believe you've done this. I was like, my finger slipped. I swear, I swear, I swear. And I was like, I'll replay it, I replay it. So we replayed it and I got him killed again. And I was like, you know what? It's just meant to be. It's Mike just is dead, everyone. To, yeah. 
And they still talk about it well over a year later now. They still talk I'm, about I'm, it. So I'm sure there's like an Instagram page or like some Twitter, some, some group <laughs> somewhere that you killed Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is. There definitely is. I'm not surprised. Probably lobbying me at this very moment, getting me cancelled for killing Mike. Maybe. So as we talk about going backwards and looking backwards, I'd love to know like how it all started. Because I know you studied uh, broadcast journalism yeah. at Nottingham Trent University. And then was it was it always an interest to go into sort of radio and, and that, this sort of medium? Yeah, I, I, it was before I even went to university. I wanted to be a radio presenter. I wanted to be a radio presenter since I was 15. Wow. Um, so I was one of those weird kids who knew what they wanted to do straight from the off. And I, I had that focus straight away. And it was, um, it was very, it was great because um, I, I didn't need to kind of work out what I needed to do. And I knew the right path. And so I was doing work experience from like 16 all the way through until I actually managed to get a gig in radio um, throughout university. I used to, uh, at the weekends, I would drive down to my parents' house in Essex, leave the car there, get the train to London, do intern on a show um, at well, what was then XFM, but Radio X now. Yeah. Um, I mean, I enjoyed doing the interning on the show and helping out, but it was on a Sunday night and I wasn't allowed to, but no one was in on a Sunday night. So I could just use the studios to practice, do the demos, record demos myself, and then send them to the program controller and be like, Hey, this is what I would sound like on your radio station. Let me know if you've got any feedback or like how I could help out. So I would love to hear your, your demos. I, <laughs> would, not. <laughs> I would not. Um, yeah, no, I know. No, you know what, actually that it's funny you should mention that. I mean, that's one of the first things that you kind of have to come to terms with when you're, when you're doing, when you want to be a presenter, I guess. Um, enjoying the sound of your own voice for sure for sure now i love it i can't yeah. get enough of it so, so <laughs> Tep, I, don't, I don't know the radio process how does it work from jumping to radio hmm. show to radio because you're on krang at the beginning yeah at the very beginning yeah and then you're on radio x and then the chris moore show and then yeah so how does it work from jumping to show to radio to radio how does it work yeah so um it's you have <sighs> How do I describe it? I guess, you know, in any work space, you want progression in your life. You know, you want to um, be at the top of your game, as it were. Yeah. Uh, at least I assume most people would want to. Um, so, I mean, for Kerrang, it was an amazing station to start at because it it wasn't live. It was all pre-recorded, the station. Bauer had moved it to pre-recorded. They moved it out of Birmingham live and pre-recorded down in London. Um, and so... I didn't have that pressure of having to perform live, having never done a, you know, actual presenting gig beforehand. Mm -hmm. So I could kind of cut my teeth a little bit. And that actually worked really nicely in my favor because I could practice essentially, do the perfect link and know what the perfect link was. And then the next time I could come around and be like, right, I know what I need to do from last time. Let's see if I can do it immediately and just try and work up to that live element of immediacy. Um, and then it got to the point where, um, you know, I, I wanted to move on and, and go into that live environment because that's proper radio, right? You know, that live interaction with the audience, the atmosphere in the studio, mm. the energy of the music. I had that relationship with XFM Radio X. And as soon as XFM became Radio X, um, the controller over there, Chris Bourne, um, he was like, we've got a space for you. Do you want to do, uh, <laughs> do you want to do early breakfast at the weekends, four till 6.30 a.m. Saturday and Sunday? Yes, yes, without a doubt. Yes, I do. My immediate reaction was yes, yes, I do. Absolutely. Where do I where do I sign? And look, it wasn't it wasn't like see you later, Kerrang. I'm off to Radio X. It was like this has come up for me. I really want to do this. I feel like it's a really good progression for me. And Rick Blackstill, who um, I think he's still the PD. I'm not hundred. I think he's still the PD of Kerrang, but he definitely was when I was there. Said it's a great opportunity for you. Go and do it. Amazing. And um, and he he let me he let me go and um, moved on to Radio X where I was. Oh, it was so amazing, but so tough doing those early breakfasts at the weekends because I was doing the radio. I was live. It was my dream, but it was at the weekend, and all my mates were going out, and I was 22, 21, 22, trying to enjoy myself but still kind of keep the dream going and keep the momentum moving forward and progressing. And that was such a hard thing to balance. There were times where 
I went out, didn't drink and just stayed up all night and just went and did the show um, at the odd time. You have to give yourself that release, I think, from, from time to time, as we were kind of talking about before. But yeah. it, it, I, I worked hard and, um, and it paid off. And a year later, Vernon Kay decided to leave the station and they offered me mid-mornings during the week, taking over from Chris Moyles. Um, and Chris was, the, Chris was the person that I'd listened to growing up. He was that Chris Moyles show was the show on Radio 1 that I'd listened to in the car on the way to school, the show that made me want to do it in the first place. So to be able to kind of take over from that and learn from him a little bit was really nice because he's an expert in his field. You know, there's a, there's a reason that he, you know, he was, um, or oh, he holds the record for the most listeners on, on the breakfast show on radio one, you know, like over 10 million. It's crazy. You wow. think about that really, every that, morning, over 10 million people would really, tune into him. I didn't know yeah. that was the figure. Yeah. Wow. Over 10 million people would tune into him. Mad. Um, and Chris is very sweet to me. He, he he's the sort of person that if he likes you he likes you <laughs> if he doesn't he doesn't so um luckily luckily he liked me and um he always was on hand just to kind of throw me throw me a bit of advice here and there when i need it and the same with johnny vaughan as well who was doing drive time and still is doing drive time yeah um you know i had i i was essentially presenting on the same level as absolute legends in the game who'd been there for years and years and years and knew this gig inside out that was a again it's good to think back isn't it i'd actually never really thought about it like that but yeah it's kind of crazy and is it is it usually because obviously with actors and singers and stuff they all like they audition they send tapes and stuff is yeah. that how people get into radio and yeah how you move from different radio stations you just send them a demo tape and then they go yeah i like your stuff i think in the in the early yeah in the early times of your career yes mm. um because people don't know who you are or what you sound like so so much so um you'll send you'll send a demo in and you'll essentially act as if you are on their radio station and you'll 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 present like you're on their radio station it'll be about sort of three minutes of of your best bits essentially um uh but when you get when you get to a a certain a level. higher level i suppose yeah. it's more okay we know what you sound like but come in and do a pilot for us just so we can be sure of what you would sound like on our station. So it's not so much you have to audition. Well, no, you do have to audition. That's wrong. You do have to audition, I suppose, but you but don't it, have to. But it's more like, are you, are you, like with the tone of the audience and, that, and their audience. And that yeah. Thing. It's more like, would you, we like you, would you fit here more than please have me, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? For sure. <laughs> yeah. And rather than me going up to the door and begging. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like, all right then, you know, I can go there. I can go there. I can go there. But so yeah. your so your show focuses on rock, indie, and like alternative music. So well, it's 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 changed now. So so Thursday nights does. Right. Okay. It, it started as the Radio One indie show, which did focus on that, and now that's just Thursdays. And now on Future Artists, we can play everything and anything. That's amazing. So yeah. how? So if you could play anything and everything, what do you choose? <laughs> do you well, know? yeah. No, that's a really good question. Um, the musical landscape has dramatically changed over the last few years. Streaming has had a huge impact on people's tastes. Yeah. Um, people's tastes are no one really, um, it's not as tribal. So genre doesn't exist like it used to. It's not like in one corner of the playground, you had the emos and the metal heads being all reclusive. And then in the other corner of the playground, you had like the pop kids fangirling over their favorite boy bands, favorite girl bands or whatever. And then the other corner of the playground, the indie kids and so on and so forth. It's not like that anymore. Everyone's integrated. Everything is cross pollinated. The hip hop guys are dressing like punks and um, the, the punks are listening to hip hop um, and SoundCloud rappers and all this kind of thing. And there's this huge cross pollination. And so when it comes to picking the music for me, it's about, okay, that cross-pollination, how do you, um, how are you pushing the boundaries of those genres um, and how are you taking them further? But also, um, what are you saying in your music? And that's become more prevalent, I think, than ever recently. Um, this younger generation is incredibly switched on. They're so intelligent. They know what's right and wrong. And... Um, 
and they want to feel that within the music. They want to stand for something in the music and represent something. So in that sense, perhaps it is, it's tribal in, in, in the lyricism, but um, certainly not in sound anymore. So, you know, something that is emotive, something that makes you feel something, something that stands up for something and something that sounds exciting is, is kind of my, my, my parameters, I suppose, when I'm picking music. And I'm assuming when you're kind of like looking for new stuff, your friend mm. might be like, oh, check out this artist. And then you check it out and you're like, oh, that's All the time. so cool. <laughs> <laughs> that must be, it must be so cool that like you're just playing stuff that you feel resonates with you, but also do you also have to, have to think about as also what an audience member might portray this as well? Because obviously you have a feeling, but it might not be so much that the audience will resonate with the same thing that you resonate with. Is that also something? Totally. That yeah. I mean, that's the amazing thing of music. It's totally subjective. So something that, um, yeah. that I might personally not like, the audience might love. And there have been plenty of cases of that. And one of my jobs as a, I guess you'd call it a gatekeeper um, within the music industry, is to make sure that I have an open mind and that I am able to leave my ego at the door, my own personal taste at the door in pursuit of, catering to the audience and creating their and creating their experience in the best possible way mm. you know i um where the playlists and the streaming have the luxuries they have the time to really pick what the audience might love but where i have the luxury is that i can talk about it i can put loads of color around it and big it up and ha actually have a personal relationship sure. nowhere else can do that yeah so it's so your radio is so unique like that and that's why it will always be top dog for me um, and so I just have to be really, really careful with the music and make sure that I'm really particular about it. And, you know, there, there is a lot of good stuff. There yeah. is this middle ground where there is a lot of good stuff, but I want to take it that next level up. And I want to say, look, we're only playing the best of the best out here. And I want to, and I don't want that to be like, you're not good enough. I want that to be a, this is what, this is what the level you need to be at. Push yourselves further you know, that kind of thing. I want it to be motivating. Yeah. But who makes that level then? This is me being down. Who makes that level and who makes that middle level? Like what is, because obviously as we're saying, like it's all subjective. Like I recently stumbled upon this band that I'm obsessive now. It's called yeah. Half Alive and their single Steel Feel, I think it's called. And it's so groovy. And because I'm a massive jungle fan. So like, yeah. I'm like, when I hear like still feel, I'm like, that's a level. That's a funky level. And if you're not at that, that level, then I'm like, okay, cool. But And uh, you, yeah. you would be right in saying that. That is a band that I have supported and a track that I've rinsed on the show. I love that song. I only found it's it out right. like, two, two, three weeks ago. And I saw the music video and I reached out to their management, Daniel. And I was like, I yeah. absolutely love it so much. <laughs> um, I was like, I want to do something with you. I want to do something with the band. But it's so amazing when you do find that. But like, I can, I can kind of understand like when you hear sound, you're just like, or like when you hear like Billie Eilish and you hear like the, the, the production on it, mm. just like, oh, I understand now that's where we're aiming for, for music to be. It's, it's a really difficult one, that question, um, in terms of what creates that middle ground, what creates that upper echelon. Um, I think for me, I have always, I've never actually been in a band, but I have always been very musically inclined. I've always listened to music. I've always consumed audio. And I, I have a, I feel like I have a very good understanding of what sounds good for sure. and what people will like. Um, Cause you also know your audience better than anyone. So you, kind yeah. of, you'll know what they will like as well, or you have an inkling of what it is. Mm. Listen to them. I think it's about understand, like you said, it's about understanding the audience, what they stand for, what they like and who they are and what they go through. And then when you hear the music, connecting what they're, the artists or the bands are talking about in the music with what the audience are looking for. So if a band is talking about, uh, or if you've got like a female punk band that is talking about sexual harassment in the music industry, yeah. um, there will be, sorry, let me rephrase that. Every single female out there will resonate with that because they, yeah. every single female has been through that experience, whether it's within music or not. Um, every single male 
well, not every single one, but pretty much nigh on, most males probably haven't experienced that. Yeah. So there, it's 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 a it's a definite one because you've got a part of the audience that will resonate with it because they have been through it, and then a part of an audience that needs educating on it and mm. and needs help understanding the the context around the song. So there, you kind of got the two parts of it. It's like picking stuff that the audience knows they uh the, no sorry it's like picking stuff that the audience has experienced and can connect to and then picking stuff and cherry picking the stuff that they might not have gone through and yeah. might need to hear about from an experience from the other side of the world or something sure. that their gender doesn't go through or you know whatever it is so yeah, yeah it's just, it's about that kind of thing yeah and it's there's something about like how the music has sort of changed as well in terms of its representation for Kind of, I think when we talk about Priya before we were recording this about kind of masculinity, and mm. like, I, I was I was talking about like how like Young Blood is kind of ha having that effect, and back in the day with Prince and David Bowie, I wonder what you from your experience as well, like promoting sort of like this sort of like like knocking down the the kind of like stereotype of what kind of ma males are in the in the music world. Cause I like little Nas like music video recently. I mean, mm. that was so like extra <laughs> and out there and stuff. Yeah. Like, I haven't seen stuff like that ever. Me personally, I've never seen it. And I was like, amazing. That's that stuff. That work is happening. Yeah. I, um, I think when you go back to Prince and, and Bowie, um, it's always been there, but I think for them, it didn't perhaps maybe scream to the wider audience. Mm. Um, the music did but I think in terms of the image and and how people then dressed and and that kind of thing to the wider audience maybe it didn't quite cut through as much whereas I think now you're seeing you know boys walk out there in their dresses or you know not being afraid to to paint their nails or put some makeup on or, or whatever it is and I think um Youngblood is a great example of that because, you know, he, he essentially talks like and likes music like a uh, fat single bloke, 40-year-old single bloke at a pub with a West Ham tattoo <laughs> on his, on his upper arm, like Oasis and all mm. that kind of thing. <laughs> but he dresses and talks about stuff in his music like a like a yeah like a liberal gen z 2021 young person and yeah, yeah. um and that could i think that mix of the two kind of says to the you know the laddie beer drinkers out there oh it, it's okay to be like that and i can be like that and still be a laddie beer drinker and enjoy myself but i can also be kind of free and just be wild and be a bit mad and you know he's taught me a lot as well um about myself and how i can just be a little bit freer and it also helps in connecting with your audience as well in in what you're doing because you know you're you're then able to talk to a broader wider audience and like we we're talking about before educate the ones who maybe aren't kind of thinking like that and help them to think like that and it's not forcing people to change the way they live or paint. It's not forcing people to paint their nails or whatever. It's just saying it's okay if you want to do it, you know? Yeah, for sure. And social media has enabled that to your advantage to be able to connect to your audiences in a totally different way. Yeah. And it's, it's, 100%. it's amazing, but it's about, I think there's, a, I've been talking to a lot of people about um, that we've been slowing down a lot now, but obviously mental health has been rising and it's, I, I've been saying to a lot of people, it's about utilizing social media to your advantage. And I know when to switch off and not, I, uh, for me, I get quite bored of TikTok. After like five videos, I kind of switch it off because I'm like, I'm not really being productive anymore. So I know when to switch off, when to not to look at things, that sort of thing. But some people just can't. And it's about- right, I, will, I will sit on the toilet on TikTok until my legs go numb from leaning <laughs> on them. <laughs> Honestly, I'm terrible. I'm terrible. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's about understanding like how to use and also music artists knowing how to use and to connect it to their audience in a very effective way. And now you've got like augmented reality things now where I think it was at Niall yeah. from BAFTAs did that um, uh, avatar thing, which a friend of mine, two friends of mine did the production on it. They did the video and I was just like, oh my God, like 
this is amazing. This is 2021. What's going to happen in four years time? Like what we're going to be doing then now. And it's just like, it's crazy how social media and the internet has literally just shot up over like the last, I don't know, 10 years. Yeah. It's been crazy powerful and has been a really, but has, I think been a really useful tool for me um, during this period for sure. I, I would have been lost without it, without a doubt. And there are, there are horrible sides to it, um, which I think people come across more often than not, which is a shame. But as I was talking about before with the, with the discord server and the kind of scene and culture that I created around the show and what I do, God, it's positive. It's so wholesome. Like all these kids are there for each other. And it's a really, it's a small little pocket of the internet that is so, so good for the soul. Um, and, you know, that's down to platforms like Twitch, TikTok, Instagram, who just, you know, innovating and, and helping, um, helping and, creators like me. And Clubhouse. Connect. Clubhouse, if you've been on Clubhouse. Clubhouse, yeah. Oh. I to be honest, I never, I've never run it out on Clubhouse. I, I checked it out a little bit. But um, I don't know. To me, to me, it just felt a little bit too, it just felt a bit too exclusive with the whole invite thing. Whereas, and I felt like I was kind of alienating my audience. A little bit. I think they're now making it public soon. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah. Oh, well, that might be then the perfect, yeah, I think perfect time to go for it. Very exclusive to get. It's. I think it's like most things. I think. Well, not most things, but I think some newer apps like they become, like Raya, for instance. I don't know if you've heard of. Raya. <laughs> oh, is that the dating app? That's a. It? It's a dating app. It's kind of like so yeah. Soho House membership sort of thing where you have to be <laughs> like on the committee. Like you have to be know someone to know. Oh someone. God! You have to um, be on the committee. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's 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 interesting, isn't it? How these these apps really do connect us, and obviously some audiences are catered to one app, and other apps are catered to another audience and stuff. It's just mm. it's amazing how you're able to navigate your audiences between different platforms and then bring them along with your journey as well. I think that's amazing. Yeah, I think that would be my advice for what is always my advice for musicians or actually just kind of anyone creative industry, like all these apps have different strengths. They might copy each other. And, you know, for example, stories is now on everything, but um, they all have different strengths. You know, Twitter for me is like a stream of consciousness. You know, if I just think a random thought in my head, I'll probably just tweet it out to see if anyone connects with it. You know what I mean? Um, I'm going on to your Twitter now. I'm going to, I'm going to be following you. <laughs> I don't think I'm, I don't, I hardly ever use Twitter, but I'm going to go on it purely. Yeah. Look at well, your... This morning I was shaving and I was like, God, this is so Am I allowed to swear, by the way, or not? Yes, you can swear. Oh, okay. I was like, this is so fucking boring. <laughs> um, and um, I was like, God, I just wish I could be face bald. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't want to lose the hair on my head. Face I just want to lose the hair on my face. So That's I just want to be face bald. So I never have, have to shave again. Have you never like, wanted a beard? Yeah, no, no. no. I can, yeah, I can grow a beard. Yeah, I know. I'm just jumping. Some people hate beard. <laughs> no. Like, oh, I see. Oh, sorry. Um, no, no, I've never had a beard. Oh, no, actually, no, I'll tell a lie. No, when I was in between Radio X and Radio 1, I had like six months off work. Um, and I decided to grow because I actually give you, Jay, I can only grow the goatee kind of goatee, mustache. That's, that's still a strong look, though. Yeah, it was. It was all right, actually. It was quite a strong look. I quite liked it. And I'm naturally um, ginger. And uh, so I get this I get this big ginger beard kind of around right. the front of my face. But then well, the sides all patchy. When you first started radio, because I'm, I, I'm my, I don't know this information. What was the time when radio started using video? Because beforehand, it was obviously just audio, wasn't it? So no one could see you. So when I reckon it, when we had video in. because Well, yeah. I think Radio 1 were always the kind of forefront of it to start off with, I seem to remember. I remember they, they for, for years, they always had a webcam in the studio. And if you went on, if you listened to it on the internet, if your dial-up connection was strong enough, <laughs> you could stream, you could stream these still pictures of this webcam that would refresh every like, five minutes or something right okay. so that was like that's the first thing and i remember i remember like watching i don't know like zane low whilst i was listening to him and these little pictures of him would refresh these really blurry pixelated almost like sony ericsson like <laughs> pictures <laughs> you could and it could have been anyone to be honest who knew and i just thought it was zane low i don't know um so that was the first thing and i reckon that was probably that was probably like early 2000s and then Podcasts were a big thing. And then after that, after podcasts really came through and like, I don't know, what was that, like 2004, 5, 6, something like that. Then I think the visual stuff started to kick in. So I would say just before 2010, probably the first visual stuff started to come through. Um, and Radio 1 was always at the forefront of that. And now it is, um, 
it's it's like uh radio one has a whole visual division to oh it. really yeah so it has yeah it creates visual content for iplayer as radio one and radio one is not i think this is the thing that people maybe misunderstand a little bit when it comes to kind of measuring the parameters of how well radio one is doing radio one is not a radio station really anymore it is primarily how it started out but it does so much more than that now. And, um, and that's because its audience does so much more and it has to cater to what its audience wants. And young people are so fast moving mm. that radio one is constantly changing and it can't just measure itself on radio listeners. That's not, that's not accurate anymore. It has to use YouTube views and interaction. It has to use engagement across Instagram and all this kind of stuff. It has to do that. Um, and so, yeah, I, Radio 1 out of, I think, every BBC station almost has the difficult task. It's almost like the guinea pig because the young people pick up all this stuff right at the beginning. And so Radio 1's like, oh, God, we have to do this now and then this and now this and all this kind of thing. And it's, and it's, you, it's constantly kind of just keeping up with the, the young people and what they're doing. Whereas, you know, you get like your Radio 2s, your Radio 4s or whatever, and, you know, they've got a few years to kind of work up to it and build up until that audience kind of shifts over and, and needs that kind of stuff from them, if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I feel for some of those people in Radio 1. It's, uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a tough job, job keeping up with the young people. It's it a is. hard job. But it's, it's, yeah. it's even now that you have to, you guys as, as radio presenters need to like think about what you dress like as well, rather than just going, I've got to sound great. Yeah. I need to now be presentable. I can't just go in like my PJs. I mean, you could probably God, yeah. PJs anyway, but... Those are the times. Actually, to be fair, I was never in those times, but um, I can imagine that was probably great. Just being able to like, like, you know, when, when you think back to it, or we hear the stories from like the older, the older days where the presenters just used to go out with the, with the bands all the time and just like get wasted after the show and then come and then roll into the show, having not slept for the whole night and all that kind of thing. And they could do that because they weren't on camera or anything like that. But now, you know, if like, I don't know, if I'm doing a, a video for the show or whatever. Yeah. And, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy though. The, the, what I, the hit, the stories I hear from the music days when like it was the wild stuff, like the eighties and nineties. And I, I yeah. in that, that era. And I'm just like, I, I hear these stories. I'm like, no way. I know you can't believe it. Can you? Cause yeah. I, I almost, you know, when I, when you hear those stories, it's kind of like, well, why isn't it like that anymore? And I think, I don't know. I, I don't really know, to be honest. I think just, things have just got a lot tighter and you can't, I guess you can't get away with as, as much anymore. Otherwise yeah. um, the cancel culture comes for you, I suppose. Yeah. The cancel culture is very, very strong. They, they, yeah, it's crazy how much people have power. Now you uh, read it now. Reddit has so much power with the whole, yeah. it, I, I don't know exactly the whole kind of premises about it, but they've been buying stock or something about that. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, I mean, the, the, the big thing that was in the news was um, GameStop, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's First it. off, yeah, and yeah. Um, Reddit, the power of Reddit is incredible. They're basically like, GameStop's going under, let's buy a load of shares from them. Um, and so they invested in a load of shares, and then a lot of rich people tried to get on board with it, and they pulled, <laughs> they pulled all the shares and made the rich people lose a load of money. So essentially, it was, it was, like, it was, it was kind of a ploy to, I think, um, well, one, to save GameStop, but also to to kind of stick it to the people that you know invest in stocks and shares and try to make money off it. I think um, I think it was just a kind of it's the internet's form of a joke. <laughs> I know, but people have much more power than they used to nowadays. It was yeah. like it was like we you had the celebrities and the rich people, and now from social media, now people like you and me, like my 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 neighbour Mary down the road, can now be a TikTok instant uh, sensation. Yeah and because and, reddit in these communities can really make movements good and bad and that's quite scary and uh, yeah yeah i i i love it for that but i think i do think there is a problem um council culture has gone too far um and i'm certainly not condoning you no know, terrible things that some people do but there are points where people make mistakes um, and I refuse to believe that any of those people trying to call out, you know, a celebrity for making a mistake hasn't made one in their lives. For sure. Um, 
and no one deserves to be cancelled just because they fucked up one time. No one does. Um, as long as they come out, they apologise and they learn from their lesson, that that should be the way it goes. Um, I agree. But instead, you kind of you kind of get a celebrity making a mistake. You get all these people coming for them, and then they're suddenly like, "Oh shit, I've got to apologise," and the whole thing's very flippant anyway. And it's and it doesn't and there's nothing genuine about it anyway in the apology. Because they've been told by the PR that they need to yeah. apologise rather than like they actually want to. Maybe they do really want to apologise, but it's come it comes across in a, a different way because they yeah, have- totally. Because it's so blown up and and yeah. out of proportion that they're suddenly panicking like, oh my god, I need to do this big sort of PR uh, thing. apology, PR apology. Yeah, and it's and and I think someone like um, I look at KSI for example, um. And look at the videos he used to make in comparison to the way people uh, or the way the younger generation can kind of hold themselves and believe they should operate now. Mm. I mean, there's some, I mean, it's not, it doesn't sound great for him, but the fact is it was a different time. You can't, you know, it was a different time and people didn't really hold themselves in, in the same way or to the same standards. They didn't. And, um, but you can't go out and cancel him for that. You can't go out and try and ruin his career for that. You can ask him to apologize. And I think that's fair for sure. But you can't, you can't go out and like, and try and ruin his career for it because it was a different time. And it's, it's a very difficult thing in the internet because time doesn't really exist, right? If it's there, it exists in the present and it always will do. And, um, that's the really difficult thing for people to get their heads around. And once you start, once one person says something and the next person cottons on, it's the, I call it the sheep effect, isn't it? It's like one follows the next and the next and the next and the next. You can't, you can't stop it. You cannot stop it. Mm-hmm. It's difficult. So, so as we sort of round up our episode, um, cause it's been absolutely amazing. I've really, really enjoyed it. And you're such a <laughs> yeah, it's been fun. person. Um, how, what would you kind of advise or like give back to your audience or even your younger self like that something has inspired you because we get so many amazing guests on this uh, this podcast and i'd love to know what's inspired them that they would give back to someone else as a so do you mean like a can it be anything it could be anything. it could be like a mantra that you that you kind of like hmm. live by it could be like a painting a, uh, a music song that okay you, got it anything. so it can literally be anything anything that's inspired um Something that's inspired me. Um, I think, I don't know, the first, well, the first thing that comes to my mind is my dad. Yeah. Um, although I don't really want to give my dad away. <laughs> <laughs> I'd quite like to hold on to him if that's all yeah. right. But anything, <laughs> it could be something that he might have said, some advice. My dad, my dad said this a really, really good advice. He says, um, uh, what does he say? He says, he says, uh, he says something like, um, uh, everyone, everyone needs to do what they need to do. And I, cause I didn't really understand it for a long time. And basically it just means that it takes all sorts in this world to have the world around. We all can't be this CEO. Mm. We all can't be whatever. And so you should never judge anyone for what they do. You just let them be, they need to do what they need to do. If, you, if you're really happy working at asda or you're really happy working at i don't know sony music as whatever it's really important not to judge anyone for what they do because they all got their stories they want to they all they all got to where they are because they really want to be there and so i Mm. I really like resonate with that going okay never judge anyone because you don't you never know their story i think it's more for me it's more the way he was always there Mm. so it's not necessarily what he said it was just how he's always been there for me when no matter how stressful his day is if i phone him he will always pick up the phone and be like what's wrong like how can we sort it and um and i think i've really taken that on board and kind of taken it through into into what what i do now and you know there are young people coming through that are asking me for advice and you know wondering how i did it and I'm always happy to be there for those people because I needed it really, really badly when I was coming up. And my dad was always there for me. He didn't, he's never, he's not in the 
industry entertainment yeah. industry or anything like that um but he just he had the life advice and um and i think no matter how stressed or or how many tears were rolling down my face or how much i didn't believe i could do it anymore he'd always talk me round um to to make sure i was on the right path or kept on the right path um and always believed in that i could do it um but he very much left me to my own devices as well to kind of make the mistakes and learn from them and, and that kind of thing he's um he really is a one of a kind sort of person who who is yeah con or who is constantly changing my life so um sounds like it i mean yeah i'm i'm going to have to i'm i'm going to have to give away my dad I think that's what's <laughs> going to have to happen. Or maybe can we do a renting? Can we do a rent policy or a scheme like a rental scheme? Maybe. maybe get, yeah, because he sounds like a wonderful guy, and sometimes you just need that little advice. Yeah. So you need that kind of extra support. Going, no, you just keep going. Go, keep going. It's hard now, but it will get easier. Definitely, I'm sure there's probably been some profound quote that he's told me, said to me before, but I can't really, I can't really remember it. So I'm going to just have to give him all away. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> it's all right. Um, well, I want to say thank you so much for coming on 360 yourself. It's been an absolute joy. I've been smiling all the time. Um, people who can't see me, but if you can, if you can see me, if you're on our YouTube channel, uh, you can definitely see me smile. If you are listening, maybe it's coming through my voice. I'm really, really enjoying my time with Jack because he is amazing. And he's just so endearing. Like, I just like how your energy and your, I can understand how you've rose up the sort of like uh, the positions and where you've got to now because you're just a likable person. Like when Oh, you thanks, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> Not many people say that, but I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they do. But anyway, I want to say thank you again so much for your time. All the best. And I'm sure I'll be talking to you very, very soon in the pub somewhere. Maybe. Yes, hopefully we get to clink a pint together soon and yeah. uh, properly hang out.